Hello guys and welcome to the Beyond Sanas channel, my name is Shanks and today we're gonna cast a replay and analyze the gameplay in Battle for Middle Earth 2 on the patch 1.09 version 2.0. It's a great team play on a 2v2 match before losing any more time, let's get it started. Let's do this. The ring is rolling and we are loading into the game in the 2v2 match on the patch 1.09 version 2.0. BFME 2 this day. Alright, so we have the White Goblin player Casper at the bottom left side. His ally is the Blue Man of the West player Sauron at the bottom right side. They are against uh, the Blue Isengard player Ectelian at the top right side. And his ally at the top left side is the Orange Isengard player Scorpion. So double Isengard against Man of the West and Goblins. And the host of this game is the Isengard player Ectelion, by the way. Alright, two tunnels coming up for the Goblin player at the bottom left side. We see two farms coming up for the Man of the West player. And this patch is looking beautiful. Look at the design of the farms. Everything is looking so great. And also the basement floors around the fortress are looking clean. Two farms into the barracks coming up. He was also using the human wood around this side, by the way, uh, to scout this area. Scorpion, the orange Isengard player, was using the vision of Palantir to scout his opponent. And Sauron once again was picking up the human wood just to scout, you know, the faction of the opponent player. Because unlike in Rise of the Witch King in BFME 2, if you pick random, your opponent doesn't get the chance to see your faction in the loading screen. So pretty important to keep this in mind. Two furnaces, three furnaces into the work pit slot coming up from Isengard player Ectelian. We will have some soldiers of Gondo and you can see we have less units available in the barracks, but you are able to buy the banner upgrade from the barracks in BFME 2. And we will have Goblin Slot. Goblins are also cheaper in compared to Rise of the Witch King. They cost uh, 75. In Rise of the Witch King, they cost 100 each. So, I mean, I like those 2v2 matches in BFME too. They are great because we will see lots of heroes, power points from the spell book, you know, lots of shenanigans, lots of fiesta. And you know me, I like fiesta quite a lot. And now I also know you guys. You also like to see fiesta games. Okay, so we have uh, also Warp Pit start into the Uruk Pit coming up from the Orange Isengard player Scorpion. And also the same also from Ectelian pretty much. So he will go for the Infantry units and for the Cavalry units at the same time. And you can also see the Warp Pit, right? In the BFME 2, you don't have Warp Packs. You have only the normal Warp Riders, but you can get them on the field from a level 1 Warp Pit. We have Tower Guards on the field and those are the only pikemen from Men of the West. Unlike in Rise of the Witch King, those Rohan Spearman units, uh, they don't exist in BFME 2. So, long story short, there are few differences between BFME 2 and the expansion of BFME 2, which is called the Rise of the Witch King. Many, many differences actually in every single faction. Also, general differences between the, you know, the PowerPoint spellbook and also the leadership stacking system. Everything is quite different. And we are working currently on a video which is going to show you guys every single difference between the factions and the general changes between these two games. Beautiful trample is incoming from the Warc Riders. They are using the whole ability. To make sure to one shot those soldiers, and this way he was able to keep the furnace protected. Kribane was used uh, to debuff the enemy units, by the way. We have crossbowmen on the field, and also Warc Riders from Isengard, and he's going for a counter attack, but he will be matching those uh, tower guards. He has to avoid trampling them because they will get one shotted if they will be getting touched by this mighty tower guard. Alright. Kribin is still active, so it means uh, the enemy units are losing lots of stats, damage and also armor is being nullified and uh, leadership is being nullified. And also on top of that you are losing uh, damage and armor. So debuff in BFME 2 is uh, really really powerful because you are able to not only nullify the leadership, just like in Rise of the Witch King, but also you are able to nullify the enemy buffs, for, um, uh, for example from the Rallying Call. Okay. So we have uh, Urukai leading forward, and Urukai are of course stronger than Goblin Warriors, and uh, also no half thrust Swordman existing in this fissure, unlike in Rise of the Witch King, you are only able to recruit those half troll pikemen, the Cave Trolls, and the Mountain Giants for the Siege. He was able to keep this furnace protected, which is quite nice. And we have also, uh, you know, the Man of the West player is playing it kind of slowly, uh, slowly. As he has to because he's under attack. We have Gondor Knights now on the field. The stable is getting upgraded to level 2. That's going to give the Man of the West player, the, uh, Sauron, the chance to recruit some horses from the Riddermark. Those Rohirrim. The tunnel is going to be taken down. The builder might be in trouble from the Goblin player. Ah, he's going to be taken down. That's quite unfortunate because builders here are very expensive. They cost 450 each. So losing a builder. I mean, the Goblin builder is a bit cheaper. 
And that's also one of the differences between these games, right? Some builders, they are cheaper than the other ones. Isengard Builder and Man of the West Builder cost 450 each and Goblin Builder is a little bit cheaper by 50 resources, which is more than 10%. We have Lourdes on the field, the most cost-efficient hero on the, in the games, in BFME games generally. Some things never change and Lourdes is just high-tier hero in every single BFME game. Pikeman on the field now from the Isengard player. Uh, Scorpion. Warp is level 1, Uruk Pit is level 1, level 2 is needed for the Berserkers and unlike in Rise of the Witch King you don't have any special units here like the Uruk Deathbringers for example. Okay, so he was able to creep this with the Lourdes uh, Carnage available with level 2 similar to Rise of the Witch King but, but less damage. You get only 100% damage unlike in Rise of the Witch King which gives you 200% damage boost. This furnace is going to be protected for now. And it's a back and forth game and I believe we can now take a look into the current command points and power points. So Ectelian, the blue Isengard player, has uh, almost 6 power points collected after the Kribin, 400 command points available. Kribin once again is able to nullify the enemy leadership and buffs and also the enemy units are losing a quarter of their armor and their damage output. On the other side, Casper, the goblin player at the bottom left side, the white goblin player, has cave pads and only 1 power point collected afterwards, he has only 400 command points available. Ectelian, uh, I mean Scorpion, sorry. The Orange Isengard player has 4 power points collected after the Vision of Palantir, 450 command points available. And last but not least, the Man of the West player Sauron. He has nearly 4 power points collected after the Human Wood, and 500 command points are available. Okay, the Rohirrim are doing a nice job. They are also able to switch between Sword and Bow, unlike in BFME 1. In BFME 1, you have a special unit for this one. You have the Rohirrim, and then you have the Rohirrim Archers, but you are not able to switch the weapons. You can only be either one of these, you know, you can only be a melee fighter as a Rohirrim Warrior Battalion or the Rohirrim Archer Battalion. But on the other side, the Rohirrim Archers in BFME 1 are way more powerful than those normal Rohirrim. And I believe one of the main differences between BFME 2 and Rise of the Witch King is the, uh, the gameplay. In BFME 2 gameplay it seems a bit faster, much more punishing, so if you let your opponent pass through, and you have nothing to defend yourself, you might lose quite a lot of buildings in a matter of seconds. In Rise of the Witch King, some buildings are quite tanky, and uh, your opponent will most of the time need more time to take them down. For example, Furnaces, as you can see, they have only 1000 HP, 1080. Tunnels on the other side have uh, less HP. Uh, farms from Men of the West are a bit tankier. They have 2000 HP with level 1, so it depends on the faction you are playing. You might have a tankier building or a weaker building. While in Rise of the Witch King, every single resource building has the same stats, has the same HP. Okay? So the Rohirrim, they need to get away from this situation. They should be able to survive for now, but they are only level 1. It means the Man of the West player has to get more wells because the well healing speed is not the greatest. On the bright side, you are able to stack the wells. You can build multiple wells, and this way you can. Make sure that your allied units are able to heal up a bit, a bit faster. This one has been taken down from the Vork Riders, they are level 4. And also one of the differences here is that normal units are able to level up from level 1 to level 10, just like in BFME 1, but in Rise of the Witch King they are only able to level up till level 5. And personally I don't like this. I'm a person, I feel like anybody who is able to save his units from... Any situation for the entire game should also get rewarded with a level 10 unit. This should also be like a goal, you know? In Rise of the Witch King, the games are feeling much more spammy and you can afford to lose units. You can just sacrifice them for no reason because the punishment is not the greatest. And leveling up the units doesn't give you too much advantage. Beside level 2, that's gonna unlock the Sephiroth generation. But most of the time, that's pretty much it. Okay, so uh, back and forth game, uh, the bottom side team is under pressure, the Isengard team is doing a nice job, it's a double Isengard against Man of the West and Goblin matchup, so later on I believe Man of the West and Goblins they should come ahead because they have two different factions and I personally like the combination of good and evil in a team game because the evil faction lacks of sustain most of the time. In BFME 2, evil factions have also some sustain but not as well and as great as the good factions of course because they have no well. Um, Isengard has heal from the spellbook, by the way. I mean, that's the, that's a topic for itself, pretty much, because the differences are huge. Like, every faction is so much different in compared to Rise of the Witch King. And if you are normally watching the Rise of the Witch King videos on this channel, 
and you want to know the differences, I can suggest you just try that out yourself and you can see there are a bunch of differences. Not only the one missing faction, not only the few missing units, but way more than that. Stable is level 2, you have no Knights of Tolamroth here. You might be able to save this one. Beautiful Trample is incoming once again. Lord is almost level 5, that's gonna unlock the leadership. And I also like these uh, images, they look better in BFME 2 and compared to Rise of the Witch King. In Rise of the Witch King, the cripple and the leadership symbol is looking pretty much the same. I mean, almost the same. Work riders going for a trample. And leadership is nice because you get to damage leadership with lords, which means you have 50% um, damage for the nearby allied units and 25% combat experience. And uh, depending on the hero you have, you have damage leadership, you have armor leadership, armor inspiring, you have high tier leadership. And those individual leaderships are also able to stack with each other. That means if you have a armor leadership, damage leadership and a high tier leadership all together, they are able to stack. But it can be only once at the, at the same time. You, you, don't, you can't stack two damage leaderships pretty much. In Rise of the Witch King on the other side, you have one leadership for every single hero. And uh, it's pretty basic and super easy to understand. In BFME 2, the things are getting a bit more complicated. But I think it makes kind of sense that a hero like Theorin, for example, for 1200 should give you less uh, leadership than a very expensive hero like, for example, Aragorn or Gunsalf. Okay, there is an archer range finally coming up for the Man of the West player. And we have Fissure getting into the level 2. That's gonna give him the chance to recruit those half troll pikeman units. He has Spider Pits level 2 as well for the Spider Riders. We see Hobbit summon. They are going inside the jeans now. Let's see how much damage they will be able to deal. Rohirrim, Gondonites, uh, lots of calf units. And I think um, the Isengard player, Ectelian, is gonna lose quite a lot. He will be losing the armory, he will be losing the Warg Pit. Armory was level 2, that's gonna cost him a lot of money and time. Because you need to... Uh, he was already buying the banner uh, and the blades, I mean. I mean, he doesn't need to get the armory to level 2 anymore in order to be able to buy the blades, but he has to build the armory. When you lose the armory, you're not able to purchase any upgrades anymore. Unlike in BFME 1. In BFME 1, after purchasing the upgrades you need, you can demolish your armory and you are still able to buy upgrades on your units. But it makes kind of sense, because in BFME 1, you have limited spots. Right, you can't build everywhere, unlike in BFME 2 and Rise of the Witch King, which kind of makes sense. Okay, so Rohirrim level 3, uh, Man of the West does not have rebuild in BFME 2, unlike in Rise of the Witch King. Lourdes is almost level 6, that's gonna unlock, I mean, the pillage will be unlocked with level 7, not with level 6. Forge bleeds on this Warg Riders, but no heavy armor just yet. For now, they are still in the game. Uh, Devastation was used from Ectarian, that's gonna give him also some money, uh, dealing also a decent amount of damage to the enemy, um, you know, trees, in this case ants, but also uh, stuns every unit in the targeted area for a short duration. It's a, a great ability from Isengard, very great. He has 15 power points collected, on top of that he's going for the Watcher, which might be used defensively to defend his ally potentially. Sharku is on the field, level 3. We have also Lords now joining from the orange Isengard player Scorpion. I have seen no heroes just yet from the Man of the West player and also not from the Goblin player so far. But maybe we're gonna get to see them later on. Anyways, Casper has White Man of Thailand summon ready. Cave beds ready. Two power points collected on top of that. 575 command points available. Scorpion, the Isengard player at the top left side, has 775 command points. 13 power points collected after the White Man of Thailand, the Palantir and the Warchant. And Sauron has nearly 10 power points collected after the Hobbit summon. The Human Wood, the Rallying Call, and he has 700 command points collected so far. Lourdes is level 6, he gives you leadership, he's quite fast hero on foot, and he might be able to outrun every single other hero who is also on foot. There are few units maybe who are able to catch him, but most of the time he is a safe hero. Warchan has been used on this level 7 Vork Riders, ladies and gentlemen. That's nice to see. The Watcher was used in the middle of the map. I like the animations. Look, he's eating those tower guards alive. <laughs> All right, delicious tower guards. Am I right, Watcher? Okay, so Sharku is pretty similar. You have the Manita with level 6, which also restores your HP. But you have also the Team the Beast with level 7. Uh, targeted cavalry units come under control from Sharku. That means you are able to warm tongue pretty much the enemy calf units. Which can be quite nice against the Man of the West player, for example. He has a bunch of camp. He has Rohirrim, Gondonites, and you can steal them. 
Just like the warm tongue in BFME 1 from uh, Saruman, for example. Altman of Talent was used. He's dealing a lot of economical damage. They have also pitage, just like in Rise of the Witch King. That means whenever they get the chance to attack the enemy buildings, they will also be able to steal money from your opponent. Okay. So the fight continues around this side. Uh, Lourdes is level 2. This one is from the Orange Isengard player Scorpion. There is a tunnel, and I like the team play a lot. That's gonna give the Goblin player Casper the chance to get his units to his ally if needed to defend him. Very mobile factions, those dwarves and goblins, of course. He has also the heal around the fortress. That's why they are able to respawn. That's also unique to BFME 2. Does not exist in the Rise of the Witch King, the House of Healing. Sharku is level 4. This furnace is going down. Once again, the furnaces are quite uh, squishy buildings in BFME 2. I believe the tankiest uh, resource building in the game is from dwarves. The mine shafts, they are quite tanky. And I, they might be even tankier than in Rise of the Witch King. But all the other buildings from any other faction are, uh, in compared to Rise of the Witch King, pretty squishy and super easy to be taken down. So keep that in mind if you want to give it a try and play the patch 1.9 version 2.0 also for yourself with your friends. And if you want to meet other BFME players, the best way to be connected with people is to join our Discord community. The link is, of course, in the description down below. And you can also check me out on my Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash beyondstandards, if you want to see those great games which I'm casting and playing myself on the live stream. I would love to meet you also in the live stream, guys. Furnace level 3 in the front side and uh, also behind. You can also see the placement of the furnaces, right? They are being, they are being built next to the fur uh, furnace, I mean the fortress, sorry. This way you have a greater protection early on. That's a blacksmith coming up now for the Man of the West player. Blacksmith is also working differently in this game, by the way. Okay, trample is incoming, beautiful, nice one, nice one here, level 9 war riders, by the way. Sharku is level 5, level 7 is needed for the, level 9 is needed for the team to beast, but level 6 is needed for the man eater. Which gives you lots of sustain, we have level 10 war riders now, that's the maximum rank you can actually have. Rohirimari coming for the safety, they might be able to save the day. Great animations, great uh, powerpoints and great graphics generally in this game, feels a little bit faster. In my personal opinion, in compared to Rise of the Witch King. So one attack can change the outcome of the game, even though it feels like that the Man of the West player and Goblin player are quite behind. But it, it's changing every single time. They were attacking the Isengard player, Ectalian. He was losing a lot. Even Lourdes has been taken down. He's back in the business now, almost level 7. That's gonna unlock the pillage, which means money, money, money every time you kill enemy units. And Lourdes is nearby. So lots of calf. Maybe you need to get some more half troll pikemen, but he lost the fissure. And remember, in order to recruit those pikemen units as goblins, you have to get your fissure to level two. Isengard has some strong pikemen with the forge blades. His armory level two now. Level three is needed for the fire upgrade, but he doesn't have any crossbow man. He doesn't need that. It's also also quite expensive, 400, um, which doesn't sound too much, but it's actually a lot because you have to keep spending money into more units and eventually heroes and upgrades. So, investing this for a level 3 building, I mean, it's not too bad, because you get the level 3 building, which is going to be, of course, way tankier, and it's gonna be also acting like a tower, shooting at the enemy units, it's not bad at all. When you can afford it, when you have money, you, you know, which you can waste, you can always go for that. And this one is also actually quite, exp quite cheap, the upgrades on BFME too, I like that. Charku is level 6 now, has Man Eater. Lourdes is uh, around this side. Hobbit summon from the Man of the West player Sauron now. He's going inside the jeans. There's a White Man of Dunland summon also from the White Goblin player to spot his ally with the push. The armory is going down. The Vestation? Was, what, what was that actually? Crazy animations happening. I don't know what's happening, but the armory, I believe, is going to be taken down by the Hobbits and White Man of Dunland. Yes, it's going down once again. The White Men are hitting like a truck. They are War Chanted, I believe. That's why they are so strong. And more reinforcements coming now from the White Goblin player. They are surrounding and focusing down the Blue Isengard player, Ectelian. He has not much left on the field anymore. He will definitely need the assistance from his ally as soon as possible. Level 5 Condor Knights. Shelob is on the field as the first hero I see from the Goblin player. I see, I've also seen Gar kill the Goblin King. I take it back. There he is. Almost down, but he's not even close, baby. Level 2, he's able to get away. Skull Totem is available, of course, but it's also different in, you know, just... Unlike in Rise of the Witch King, you have leadership, you have the Fire Drakes with level 10, which you are able to summon. I have not seen any heroes from Men of the West so far. 
Not any hero, no, no Elmir, no Tilden, no Gansalf, Aragorn, Elvin. Not even Faramir and Boromir. So Sauron is playing without any heroes so far. Barak's level 3. That's making, you know, that's of course making the building way, way tankier. 6,000 HP now with level 3. The furnace here is going to be taken down. That's, you see how weak the furnaces are. With one goblin warrior all alone, you are able to burst, it, burst this down in no time. And it's hard for me to actually tell if this is good or not. Because it's, you know, I don't spend too much time on BFME 2. I was mainly spending my time on Rise of the Witch King in the last couple of months. I mean, in the last months or years even. But I want to definitely take a look more and more often in BFME 2 as well. We might also host some tournaments very, very soon for this game. If you wanna, don't want to miss them, make sure to join the Discord and also follow the Twitch channel, Twitch TV slash Beyond Standards. The links are always in the description down below. Okay, so level 7 Lords. That's great. Uh, Gorkiel is recovering over time. He's only level 2. And there is a Lord who can always cripple you down and take you, da take you out. I mean, Lord is a great and the best anti-hero in the game by far. The cripple is just like a, like a, you know, the best tool because you can just stop the enemy hero from moving away and you, you don't need to kill him necessarily, but you can also just cripple him down and this way he can't do anything. He has to just uh, stand there and sit still. Okay, counter attack is happening. The Watcher is almost back up, 12 power points collected on top of that from Magdalene, the Blue Isengard player. 550 command points available, decent amount of money. Casper has 3000 resources collected. Almost 13 power points available after the White Man Summon. E25 command points, that's quite a lot. Scorpion, the Orange Isengard player, 10 power points collected after Devastation. White Man of Thunder and Industry. Kribin, Palantir and the Warchant. And last but not least, the Man of the West player Sauron has 875 command points. He has a Ranger Summon which was used before. And uh, no heroes on the field. Uh, Blacksmith is level 3 for the Iron Ore, Forge Blades and Heavy Armor. Every single one of these is purchased already. Big attack is happening now. Oh, oh, is he gonna come against the fort? Look what is this damage, dude! That's crazy. The Watcher is coming in clutch as well. Oh my goodness. They, they touched the fortress and it was taking some. Look, Shilob. <laughs> Shilob is getting knocked back from the Watcher. Okay. But he has to be careful now. Peel back, peel back, peel back. He has to avoid fighting this. Sharku is running it down. He has to also avoid fighting this tower guards. They have Forge Blades. They're gonna one shot you. Trust me on that one. Okay, for now, the Man of the West player is safe, because keep in mind, once again, uh, Rebuild does not exist in BFME 2 for Man of the West. It's exclusively for the Dwarven faction. Lourdes is level 7. No Saruman so far. I would love to see Saruman, but we might see the big Drake very soon, because last time I checked, this Goblin player had so much money. Yeah, he's going for the Drake for sure. Look his money. He has over 5,000. Which is, yeah, he's going for the big Drake, the Dragon Lord. Soldiers with heavy armor. Uh, 15 power points collected by Scorpion. Now he might also go for the Watcher if he wants to. He has to go for the Watcher or Freezing Rain or whatsoever before he can go for the 25. And Sauron has 12 power points collected after the Ranger Summon. How far is uh, Ectidian away from the 25? He has 20 power points already. That means he's only 5 power points away from the 25, which can change the outcome of the game. Trust me on that one. 25s are just like the 10s in or the 20s in BFME 1. The Balrog Summon or the EOD Summon Army of the Dead. They are able to win the game. And of course, they have similar uh, impact in BFME 2 and also in Rise of the Witch King. Uh, that's the big difference between BFME games and every other RTS games. It's much more lore based, and that's why you have those summons, and that's the reason why Lead Game. The power points have an incredible amount of impact on the game. So you need to play for the power points and you need to try uh, you need to try to deny your opponent as many power points as you can by demolishing the buildings in time, by not sacrificing many units, by saving your heroes and pre you know preventing them from getting taken down from your opponent. And especially calf units, for example, if you lose them, you will get and you will donate so many power points and experience points to your opponent. Shilop is level four. She's gonna be level 4 very, very soon. There we go. Level 6 is needed for the Poison Stinger. Level 7 is needed for the Tunnel. And uh, allow Shilob to Tunnel under the ground and uh, emerge at any unshrouded location. That's nice. And this one, which is gonna cripple enemy units in spider webs for 4.5 seconds, which is quite a lot. 
And there comes uh, the Dragon Lord. <laughs> Look at this damage. Holy Quackamole. Fireball being blasted. Of course, the Fireflight and uh, Incinerate. Similar to Rise of the Witch King. And she's also able... I mean, I'm assuming that's a girl. That's why I'm saying she. Uh, she's also able to level up quite fast. Oh, that's a bad war chant. Not many units are remaining around. Sauron is pinging his ally. And asking him for help with the dragon. Which makes sense because there is nothing that can take down the dragon besides Lourdes. He has only pikemen and work riders. That's why the dragon is going to... Oh, talking about the dragon. There comes the dragon strike, ladies and gentlemen. Look at the black drake. Oh, not the best drake, though. He's dealing decent amount of damage. I like this animations from BFME too. That looks dope, but not enough. Not en Oh, he was able to destroy the... Oh, the fire was able to destroy both the blacksmith and the barracks level 3. The fortress also got damaged big time. 50% of the HP is gone. But the dragon lord is doing a nice job helping his ally and cleaning and killing everything from the blue Isengard play Ectarian, including the Sharku. Okay, Hobbit Summon once again, I believe. No, that's not Hobbit Summon. I take it back. And how far is Man of the West player away from the 25? The answer is 4 power points only. 4 power points only. Lourdes is gonna get uh, knocked back on the ground. He's being... Uh, he's fighting against... Oh, he was killing... <laughs> Peregrine Tuk or Meria Dog Brandybog. I don't know who that was. <laughs> but one of the Hobbits has been taken down by the Lourdes. It was Meria Dog Brandybog. But I can't believe... Oh, yes, Eomir, right? Finally, finally. I believe that's the only hero in the first hero the Man of the West player was getting on the field. Counter-attack. Let us scout for... Oh, the shield up is going down. Nice positioning and nice towers here from Ectelian. They are able to clean up those weapons of Tunland from the summon of the Goblin player Casper. In the meantime, he's... You know, we have some small fights happening around this side, but Isengard player... Uh, Scorpion should be able to handle this situation. Not a big deal. The power points are rising to the sky. 22 power points collected from an out west. Ectelian was already using the Dragon Strike. 7 power points collected on top of that. We have Casper with 12 power points after the Batman of Dunland Summon. Dragon is doing a nice job. Almost level 3. That's going to unlock the Wing Blast. Scorpion has 13 power points collected after the Watcher. 12 away from the own uh, Dragon Strike. And only 3 power points away. I believe uh, Sauron is going to be the one who is going to get to 25 first. And this game isn't over just yet. Trust me on that one. Urukbid is getting destroyed. Lots of st stuff. He might also go for the Lightning Strike. Remember the goblins, they are able to get this big fire drake. I mean, this big up fire drake. We have the ivory tower, which will give you more movement speed for the entire map. And also, you know, reveal the entire shroud on the entire map. And Isengards are able to, you know, get this lightning strike. Which is similar to the Thunderbolt from, uh, say it, from Saruman. But of course, way, way stronger. And I personally like the Gorgoroth's Spire Fireball from Mordor. You know, the big fireball you are able to shoot at the enemy units. It's dope. I like that. 25 collected. What is he gonna go for? I'm curious. I wanna, I wanna see that. I wanna see that. He's going for the Earthquake. Okay. I'm actually curious if he's gonna use it immediately. Or if he wants to combine it with a potential push. Because what you can... Oh, he's using it. Where, oh, he's using it on this one. And to be honest, not that much damage. I believe he has the armor upgrade on the fortress that's making it quite resistant. Um, let me check if the game sound is a little bit too quiet. Okay, it should be better now, hopefully. Okay. So, Signal Fire, this is also different. It gives you a cooldown reduction on the spellbook, reload time. 25% for one of them. And if you have three of them, you get 50% cooldown reduction, which is crazy. 50%, <laughs> that's, you know, you are able to reload the powers twice as fast almost. And you also get uh, decreased recharge times for unused powers, heals, nervy heroes, and uh, nearby heroes and flyers. The dragon is level 4. Remember, level 6 is needed for the flyer flight, which is in Rise of the Witch King dealing crazy amounts of damage to the enemy flyers, like for example, Felby's Witch King. Can get one shot at almost from this one. The Witch King of Mordor, who, of course, who is mounted on the Fell Beast. Okay, I mean, I was expecting a bit more from the Earthquake. He wasn't even able to kill the expansions expansions around the fortress. Uh, Sharku, level 8. Remember, he's only one level away from the Team to Beast, you know. 
Unlike in uh, Rise of the Witch King, he isn't able to give any experience points to the allied uh, Warc Riders, but he's able to steal enemy cav unit, which in 99% of the cases, let's be honest, much, is much, much better. Nice clumping. He was able to burst down the barracks level 3 with the pikemen in no time. With clumping, I mean... Oh, one more dragon. This one is blue, uh, yellow. Oh my goodness, I love the animations of this game. Look at this beautiful animation and tell me that this game is from 2006. Looks like more like 2016 to me. Or maybe 2026. Oh, we are not there yet. We are only in 2021. In, we are still playing BFME in 2021, guys. That's how beautiful those games are. And we cannot give them up. We cannot give them up. Okay, so everybody was using 25 besides Casper. The white goblin player he is still 20 power points away from his own 25 which is really a lot like 20 power points when your when isengard player um actually has almost a dragon strike backup again and he has 11 power points collected on top of that so casper is quite behind but uh, that can be changed in literally 10 look at the damage from the worm holy moly two shotting the furnace level three just like a dead Maybe because it's just too squishy, you know? Um, not even 3000 HP for a level 3 furnace. That's kind of very bad for Isengard. Okay. So there is only one single fire on this map, by the way, in the middle of the map. This map is looking like this, if you are curious. The dragon is uh, doing a nice job. I mean, the dragon is the reason why Isengard team can't go for an attack without any crossbow man. Don't just stand there, help me! You need crossbow man with fire to be able to burst down this dragon fast enough. The watcher is available by the way from Mactalian. He might be using that around this side to kill the enemy units. Let's see if this is gonna be the case. I wanna I don't wanna miss that. I don't wanna miss that. Hopefully he's gonna use it here so we can get the chance to see that. The animation of the summon. Oh the dragon is coming in clutch. And they are both focusing on Ectalian once again. I mean I believe the Goblin Man of the West team they are much more team play. Uh, heavy in this 2v2 game than the Isengard team. I've not seen them grouping once and going for a combined attack against one of the opponents. Level 10 Warc Riders against Gondor Knights. Devastation was used once again. Keep in mind, Devastation is able to stun the enemy units. The dragon is quite healthy. Lord is shooting him down. But he's able to knock down Lord on the ground, by the way, with the attack. Which is very effective against heroes. Heal is gonna be used. That's great. You are also able to heal this guy. Which is very nice and awesome. Who was using heal? I believe the Man of the West player, right? Yeah, yeah. Man of the West player was using heal. That's great. Shilop is level 6. Remember, level 7 is gonna unlock the tunnel. And Dragon Lord is getting in safety. Fireflight is almost back up. I mean, almost available, not back up. Armory is coming up now for the Isengard player Scorpion. The level 3 tunnel here is gonna be the target. But remember, tunnels in compared to furnaces are a bit tankier. Not too much, but 500 almost, you know, when they are level 3. And uh, similar in uh, BFME 2, just like in Rise of the Witch King, are the tunnels, you know? The more uh, level the resource building have, the more command points you get. Up to 100. And you are also able to build those power expansions, uh, but I believe these are not increasing your command points by 75, unlike in Rise of the Witch King. I might be wrong, though. Like, I need to mention this a couple of times, my knowledge about BFME 2 isn't the greatest just yet. But hopefully... I will be able to learn a bit more, and this way I can make those casts for you guys more interesting. I still hope that you enjoy this one. If you do, please don't forget to leave a like on this video. Likes, they are helping quite a lot on this channel, guys. And I would really appreciate you if you leave a like before you leave the video. And come back tomorrow again. Okay? So, what's the plan? Let me take a, let me take a look in... Oh, the Dragon Strike is available once again from the Isengard play Exilion. The Watch is available. And I believe if you can combine two Dragon Strikes against the same Fortress, you can take it down. Eomir is looking like this. Has also Horse Lord with level 3. Doesn't give you leadership with level 1. Unlike uh, in Rise of the Witch King. And you have Outlaw with level 6, not with level 4. So it's harder to get the money from Eomir. Elmir in BFME 2 The Rise of the Witch King is a high tier hero. I mean, he's one of the best heroes from, if not the best hero from Man of the West. He gives you so much for a low price. He costs you only 1000 and gives you so much. It's unbelievable how much you get. 
okay? So once again, this is a dangerous situation because, he, oh, he was using the Dragon Strike once again. But what I'm trying to say is like, he has nothing that can kill the Dragon Lord. And if the Dragon Lord comes here, he will get a lot of experience for free. He's level 6 now, has finally the Fire Flight. I would love to see the animation of this one. Hopefully we will get the chance to see that. Sauron is asking for help. And Casper will answer. Master the dragons. <laughs> Alright, the fortress is under attack. It's getting burst heads down. Arrow volleys are also different, but it's too late, too little, and the fortress is going down. Similar, like in Rise of the Witch King, once you lose your fortress, you are not able to make any use of your power points anymore. The dragon has to come, and he has to come now. He's coming, he's healing up over time. But Sauron is losing his production buildings left and right. I'm gonna keep an eye on this dragon, I wanna see the fire flight. But he might not even need to use it, potentially, because there is not much left anymore from the Isengard team. But that's quite impressive. So he's gonna chase down those Warc Riders, one of them is level 2, uh, level 10. The Spear Throw is coming from downtown from Eomir, Theoden is next to him, the King of Rohan and the former King of Rohan. The Dragon Strike is on cooldown from Scorpion. Earthquake is also on cooldown of course, but he can't even use it, he has not much money left. But he's able to buy the Fortress back or what? Yeah, he's able to buy the Fortress back. Remember, in this game, you are able to get give money to your ally, unlike in BFM1. And I liked it a lot. Casper uh, has almost 17 power points collected. He's asking for help. The Watcher is being summoned. The Fortress is under attack. In the worst case, you can cancel this like he did. And this way, you can get the maximum value. The Builders are way tankier in BFM2 than in Rise of the Witch King. But uh, the Vault Hub is also way more expensive. Which is... I like that, because... In Rise of the Witch King, the wall up is not expensive and you can this way save your builders all the time. But keep in mind, keep in mind that not every faction gets the chance to build wall ups, you know? Which is making it kind of more unbalanced. Uh, but in BFME 2, the builders are tankier. This way you, you don't need to uh, be worried about getting one-shotted. But for that reason, the wall up is way more expensive. Because wall up save in Rise of the Witch King is kind of lame in my opinion. Because you can just save your build down and your opponent can't do anything about that. Look at this powerpoint from the spellbook. <laughs> Heal from Isenga uh, from Goblins. You like to see that. Oh, the Dragon Strike is going to be available. The commitment against the Fortress now from Ictalian. He might be able to take it down. That's a huge army with Forge Blades and Heavy Armor. Now, after all, Pikemen are looking great. The Worm is doing a nice job. Plus 12 all the time for killing enemy units. That looks great. Okay, so what's going on here? The fortress is in a safe spot. Shilop is protecting his ally, level 8 by the way. Tower guards and all the units which you need for protection are around. Level 6 pikemen from Isengard trying to take down the worm, but they are getting one-shotted. In the meantime, a small attack is happening around this side to Scorpion. He might be in trouble, he might lose the work with level 3. It's a tanky building, don't get me wrong, with 6000 HP, but not tanky enough. Eomer, level 5, remember level 6 is needed, Armory is level 2 now, level 3 is needed for the fire arrow upgrade, but he doesn't need that. You might go for the uh, Spider Riders, by the way. Why he has double Armory? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> he has double Armory now, that doesn't make any sense. They don't stack, of course. 15 power points collected, but he can't use them just yet. Ar uh, but the Fortress is gonna be back up on the field very, very soon. It's kinda intense game though, back and forth all the time. And, of course, in 2v2 games, you are able to recover way, way easier and much, much better than in 1v1s. Because in 1v1s, once you lose your fortress, you have a huge disadvantage, you know, a huge handicap. Uh-oh, big army. Oh my goodness, even goblin warriors with forge blades. You like to see that. <laughs> All right, now they're gonna surround the fortress. The fortress is, is kind of tanky, but the dragon doesn't care. He doesn't care. He won't give it up, he will try his best to take it down. The Cloud Break is available now from the Man of the West play as well, to stun the enemy units for 10 seconds, heals and revives a light unit during 15 seconds, cancels Freezing Rain, of course the Darkness and also the Cloud Break. So if you are playing good against good and your opponent is using Cloud Break, you can use your own Cloud Break to cancel the opponent Cloud Break. Here is being used. The dragon is quite vulnerable against uh, damage from the arrows and fire. That's why Ectidian is, you know, targeting the dragon with the fortress. Quite tanky fortress though, 7500 HP, but very resistant. 
It's a matter of time. And I believe Ectelian doesn't have the... Nah, he's gonna be out of the game. He has no production buildings left too. If I'm not mistaken. I can't see anything. Oh, the dragon is going to get summoned. This one is from the white goblin player. Casper, uh, by the way. He wants to make sure to finish off this fortress. There we go. The dragon summon. But he's not dealing any damage to the fortress, dude. That's crazy. I mean, the summons, they are not meant to deal a lot of damage to the fortress. Because it would make them pretty much OP. But I was expecting a bit more than that. He might still be able to do that with aggressive stance. You are maximizing your damage output. And I believe that's it. Two more hits needed. One. And last attack. One last time. And Ectidian has been defeated. That's gonna turn the game into a 2v1 situation. In which uh, Scorpion is gonna be the last member remaining. Trampling into the pikeman because he can. He doesn't care. If the Cloud Break and Eomir is, li is like the nostalgic feeling. Remember in the films, in the two towers. Eomir... Gandalf and the Rohirrim were riding directly into the Pikeman too. <laughs> That's why Cloudbreak is so OP. You know, I would, I would, I wish Cloudbreak. Oh, there we go. I mean, that's the same dragon, but you can always use the reposition to. I like this a lot. Not many people are using that, but it's very great. Gives you the chance to reposition from any location to any location you want. But she's able to take down the towers in no time. And Scorpion, of course, the last man standing. Can't do anything about the situation. He is in a 2v1 game now after Ectelion got defeated. And uh, yeah, it's a matter of time. And I believe this game can't be turned around anymore. But I don't want to be... Uh, I don't want to jinx it <laughs> for the bottom side team. They might still lose this one. I believe in shenanigans. Look at the Shelob. She's so vulnerable against arrows. She's forced to retreat. She's level 9. Kinda a bit disappointed, not gonna lie. That Man of the West player was not recruiting any heroes, like beside Elmi and Theodin. I would love to see Aragorn and Gandalf. Gandalf is awesome in BFME 2. I love to see him. Alone the animation when he's getting recruited is just beyond standards, guys. Okay, so level 2, level 2. Armory is level 1. I believe he lost the other Armory to the Dragon Strike. We missed the second Dragon Strike from the Orange Isengard player, Scorpion. But it's fine. He is uh, fighting until the end like a real warrior and I like that. I like people when they are fighting until the end. Because sometimes I, I believe that some people are giving up way too fast, you know. You must never give up. There is always hope as Frodo, uh, I mean as Gandalf was saying it to Peregrine Zook and Frodo Baggins. There is always hope. And I believe that's gonna be it. The Worm is doing a nice job. I mean, there is always hope, but there are also exceptions, of course. In this case, I believe the only hope for the, for the blue Isengard player, for the orange Isengard player Scorpion is if the goblin player and the blue Man of the West player Sauron are getting disconnected from the game, are losing their internet connection or whatsoever. That's the only way they can lose this. Oh, glorious charge! Sonic Boom effect! And it's game over guys. I hope you enjoyed this one. If you did, please don't forget to leave a like on this video. I see you next time. Until then, take care of yourselves and as always, stay beyond standards and keep hitting like a truck. Peace.